subject this morning is the golden candlestick or lampstand or Jesus, the light of the world. Continuing our studies in the tabernacle in the wilderness and the scriptures are printed in your bulletin so let's stand together and read some selected portions of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25 beginning with verse 31. The golden candlestick or lampstand. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, a beaten work. Underline those words, beaten work. Shall the candlestick be made, his shaft, and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be all the same. And six branches shall come on the side of it. Their knots and their branches shall be of the same. All it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof. But they may be obliged once against them. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it. With all these vessels. Thank you, be seated, please. Last week we entered the holy place and we saw the gold we saw the golden table overlaid with gold and the twelve loaves of showbread. Speaking of Jesus, the bread of life. Now today, as we look over to the other side, the south side, we see a golden candlestick or lampstand. And I'd like for you to look at the picture in your bulletin. You'll know why I'm going to say what I'm going to say now. The Hebrew word for lamps or lampstand is menorah. The Greek word in the New Testament is lichnia. Both words, both Hebrew and Greek, Old Testament and New Testament, refer to a lamp or a lamp stand. There is no mention of the word candlestick in the original Hebrew or in the original Greek writings of the Bible. It just isn't there. You can go through a concordance from Genesis to Revelation and you will find the word candlestick but they will tell you that the word means lampstand because it had little olive oil <coughs> cups. They were filled with olive oil every morning and every evening and they were lighted. They had wicks that had to be trimmed and they would fill these with olive oil. They were just little almond-shaped uh, bowls that would hold olive oil. And that was the light of the holy place. There were no windows in the tabernacle. And the only light in the tabernacle was from the golden candlestick or lampstand. The lamp is supplied by oil through a wick burning the oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, of course, had the Holy Spirit with him all throughout his ministry. Now the candlestick or lampstand, and I may use these words interchangeably, they both mean the same thing, was made out of pure gold. The interesting thing about it was the, lamp, the, the branches six on each side of the stem were not added to the stem. The three branches on the left side and the three branches on the right side and the staff, the stem, were all one piece. All one piece. Speaking of the fact that we are one with our Lord. And the candlestick of the lampstand was made from a talent of gold. A chunk of gold, a talent. 
A talent weighed 90 pounds. That would be 1,500 ounces or 1,370 ounces troy, troy ounces. That's the way they measure gold. Now the candlestick or the lampstand refers to Christ. We see him in the golden lampstand. In verse 31, the pronoun, personal pronoun, his, is used five times. Why would the Spirit of God instruct Moses to write his about an inanimate piece of gold? Because it refers to a person. His flowers, his knots, his branches. Five times in verse 31, we have the personal pronoun, his. Jesus identifies himself as the true lamp and light of life. In John 5, or 9, 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, he said. Again, he said in John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare we unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness. No darkness. He is light. So the golden candlestick or lampstand is a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the interesting thing about the tabernacle is that it had no windows. The only light in the tabernacle was supplied by the lamps with the olive oil burning day and night. So I would make an application to that this morning that there is no room in Christianity for false religions. There is no room in Christianity for false doctrines. There is no room in Christianity for philosophy and psychology and postmodern theology and theories of men and suppositions. There's just no room for that. The only room in the candlestick light was from the candlestick. And God gave us 66 books to tell us all about himself. And there's no room for any addition to that. He is what he is. And he will never change. He is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there is no room for the light of humanology and human thinking and human attitudes and ideas about the Bible. There's just no place for it. God is a God of order. And he ordered the tabernacle as a picture of how the sinner may come to him. And you can't change that. You can't change the order of the tabernacle. The priests could never do it in a different way. Everything had to be done minutely and exactly as God instructed Moses up on the mountain when he gave him the Ten Commandments and the instructions for the tabernacle. He said, see to it that you make it according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. There was no leeway room to change anything. And they had certain materials with them, and they were to use those materials that God told them about. And therefore, we accept entirely what the Bible says. And we reject any additions to it or any ideas about it that don't coincide with the teaching of Orthodox theology. In 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise. Now Paul is writing the Corinthian church. The Corinthians were all Athenians. They were filled with the teachings of Socrates and Plato and other philosophers. And Paul had to 
break through that false teaching of the English of the philosophers. He had to break through that in order to get the truth to them. And he said, "Those that seem to be wise." He's speaking of men like Plato and Aristotle. They seem to be wise. Their heads seem to be filled with knowledge. But Paul, uh, Paul tells the Corinthians church that their head full of knowledge is just a head full of junk. Let him become a fool that he may be wise. In other words, let the psychologist and the psychiatrist and let the philosopher empty his mind of all the junk that he's acquired and then he can receive the word of God. Sometimes we have to empty ourselves of what we were previously taught in order to receive the truth. I had to do that. I had been taught one way as a boy. And when the gospel came to me, I realized there was a conflict between what I had been taught and what I was being taught. And I just emptied that junk out of my mind and accepted the word of God. And then I had the truth. So Paul says, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, that is worldly wisdom, let him become a fool, or let him become simple, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. That word vain means empty, useless. They don't help anybody. They can't work out problems. They seem to have answers. And they write books. And they say, we have the answers. But their answers don't help anybody. They don't work. But you can go to the Word of God if you've got a problem. I don't care what kind of problem it is. Somewhere in the Word of God, God will meet your problem. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now there is no foolishness with God and there is no weakness with God. He's all powerful, omnipotent. He's all knowing, omniscient. But Paul is speaking comparatively. If you were to compare the wisdom of God with the wisdom of man, there's no comparison. And then verse 6, How may it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to know. You take all the great philosophers of the world. They all come to naught. The Bible is still here. We're preaching it today. 1 Corinthians 2.14 But the natural man, this is the unconverted man, unsaved, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. If he doesn't have the Holy Spirit of God within him, he cannot understand the Bible. He cannot believe the Bible. He does not understand. He's in the dark. He's floundering around. He doesn't know where he's going. He do not know where he came from. And he do not know where he's headed. And he do not know what he is. He's just floundering around. Because he's in dark. He's in blindness. He doesn't know where he is or who he is. These hippies in California, I pastored there for nine, more than nine years. And they would come into the church and they'd say, Hey man, that's a pretty good, pretty good gig you got going there. Uh, where did you learn that? And things like that, you know. And uh, then they'd say, Man, I'm looking for myself. I'm trying to find myself. And I would say to him, sit down on that bench and read the first chapter of the Gospel of John. You can find yourself. Well, man, I got to find the philosophers. I'm studying Zen and I'm studying this and that and the other. I said, get on out of here. There's no use to talk to you. They don't know who 
they are, what they are, where they're going. They're blind. But our light, and we do have light, it comes from the tabernacle. It comes from God. It comes from the Bible. So we know what we believe, and we know it's true, and we know it's right. Man was born into this world spiritually blind. Uh, my wife mentioned something to me this morning about a baby being born blind. I said, well, that's nothing. We're all born blind. Adam became blind spiritually when he sinned against God, and all of his children were born blind. That includes you and I. We came into this world blind, unable to see, unable to understand. Sin has blinded us. It put our eyes out. In John chapter 9, Jesus told us of a blind man. It says in John 9, And Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. Notice, from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he be born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, as to the reason, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Then Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. If you want to get some light, you've got to get it from Jesus. He's the only one that's got it. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went on his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. When this man had a contact with Jesus, Jesus touched his eyes, told him what to do. He went and did it, and his blindness went away. And the Bible tells us in our blindness what we need to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That tells us what to do. But we were born blind. And the Bible says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, that's the devil, and blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's in creation, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He is truly the true light. Then in the second place, the lampstand was made of beaten gold. I looked that word beaten up in the Hebrew dictionary. And the word beaten has a very special meaning. It speaks of the sufferings of Christ. In Exodus 25, 31, Thou shalt make a candlestick, that is a lampstand, of pure gold and of beaten work. Notice the candlestick was made of beaten work. Shall the candlestick be made? Now, they took this talent of gold, a big chunk of gold, and they took a hammer and they began to break pieces off of that piece of gold. Until when they got through, the shaft remained and the six branches remained. They were not attached to the stem. They were all one piece of gold. The stems, the stem and the branches. Made out of one piece. It must have been an intricate work for them to hammer that so that they could come up with a golden candlestick or lampstand. And that's what they did. But getting back to the word pure gold. This was pure gold. It speaks of the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who never sinned. Who never said a wrong thing. Never did a wrong thing. The pure one. In Him 
was no sin. And then it was beaten. The Hebrew word for beaten is mekisa, and it means hammered work. Hammered work. They took a hammer and they pounded that gold into it and they beat it into a candlestick. And in Mark 14, 65, I want you to see how they hammered Jesus. Mark 14, 65 says they buffeted him. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, Prophesy! And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hand. Jesus now has been taken by the soldiers. They drag him into the hall and they begin to beat him. They buffet him. That word buffet is korafizo. And it means to strike with the fist. They had his hands tied. They had him standing there. And here were about 20 soldiers. And they begin to hit him in the face with their fists. These burly, rough soldiers striking our Lord Jesus Christ in the face with their fists. They begin to buffet him. And then they called the servants and said, Come on over, join in the fun. And the servants came and they began to bellow in the Hebrew word, strike him. And they too struck him in the face until they were tired of their sport. Can you imagine what his face looked like by this time? Twenty soldiers beating him in the face with their fists and then all the servants beating him in the face with their fists. And they had a game they played and this was their game. They called it Black Man's Buff. Kids used to play that game. But this game was different. They would take their victim that was on his way to be crucified and they would put a blindfold over his face and over his eyes. And then they would line up and each one would come by and strike him in the face and say, Who struck thee? Then the next one would come by, strike him in the face with their fist and say, Who struck thee? until all of them had done the same thing, ridiculing his claim to omniscience, ridiculing the Savior, beating him literally to death. The result of those beatings, this is before he stood before Pilate. The result is given in Isaiah 52 and verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, that is, at his disfigurement, his visage, that's his face, was so marred, so disfigured, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Jesus would have been unrecognizable when they got through with him. I've heard people tell in emergency rooms how they bring a person in from an automobile accident and his face is so swollen they couldn't even see where his eyes and nose began. Beaten almost to death. Then they would take, after they got through striking him in the face, the Roman cat of nine tails. It was a long whip and it had embedded in it bits of stone and bits of bone all the way up and down its length. And then when they struck the back of their victim, it would cut his back wide open. And they cut him and cut him and cut him with that whip. And the interesting thing about that cutting is that when they struck him on the back, it curled around his chest. And as they jerked it back, it would cut open his chest. There is a scripture that tells about that. For he said in Psalm twenty-two seventeen, 17, 
I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. What happened is when that whip was laid on his back, the end of it came around his chest, and they jerked it back, it cut his chest. Forty-nine stripes until he was almost cut to pieces. And he said in Psalm 22, 17, I may tell all my bones as he looked down from the cross, he could see his bones showing through the flesh where they had ripped him over. He did all that for me. He took all that for you. And all of Jesus' thoughts as He hung on the cross have been recorded in Psalm 22. See Him hanging there on the cross looking down on that bloodthirsty mob. What was He thinking? Well, we had His thoughts recorded in the 22nd Psalm. I'll read just a few of them. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I hesitated about bringing this description to you this morning. I had to think about it a while. And I didn't really want to do it because it's so horrible. And yet the Lord seemed to say, my people need to know how I suffered for them. So I am doing it. Beaten gold. He was the true beaten gold of the tabernacle. The one who came as he was prophesied to come. Then the lampstand was hammered. They took a hammer and they hammered that gold to make it something beautiful to be seen. And they hammered it. And Jesus was hammered during his life. He was hammered by the crown of thorns as they crowned his brow with thorns. He was hammered by the nails that they hammered through his hands and feet. He was hammered by the spear that they thrust into his side. He was hammered by the jeers of the mob and their cruel mockings. Forced to hang there on the cross with his mother and loved ones standing about. Oh, the humiliation. The humiliation of the Lord. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. <coughs> Did you know that we are also fashioned by a beating? God's people have to accept a beating. Let me show you. If you think being a Christian is a bed of roses, if you think it's just a change of philosophies, listen to what God says about what's going to happen to you if you're a Christian. Exodus 25, 31. The shape of the shaft and the, the branches were all 
into one. We are one with Him. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. That central stem was Jesus. Those six branches on each side speak of His people. And Jesus said, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endures to the end shall be saved. And when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? In other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to know that if you become my disciple, the world will hate you and they will buffet you and they will despise you. So we're being conformed into the image of Christ by trials and testings and bruisings and sufferings and beatings. Not to the extent that the early disciples were, but that may come, and I believe it's on the way. Christianity is a suffering religion. God's people <coughs> suffer. In Acts 9.16, when Ananias was told to go and to pray for Paul, who was struck blind on the road to Damascus. Ananias was afraid of him. He said, this is a man that's been persecuting us. He's been putting us in jail. I can't go see Paul. And God said, you go. He's one of us now. He's saved. You go to him. And so Ananias went to Paul, and God says, this is what I want you to tell him. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. That's election. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul, I'm going to save you and I'm going to plant your feet on the pathway of suffering. And all your life you're going to suffer. You're going to be shipwrecked. You're going to be whipped. You're going to be stoned. You're going to be left for dead. You're going to be hated and despised and imprisoned. That's going to be your life, Paul. You still want to follow me? He said, yea, Lord, I still want to follow you. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In 1 Peter 2, 21, Here unto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His steps. 1 Peter 4, 13. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4, 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God <coughs> commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. <coughs> Christian life is no place for the weak, the sissies, those who cannot bear the cross. Because if you follow Jesus, there's a price to pay, and you will have to pay the price. But in the end, will be glory. In the end, will be the reward. In closing, I also see a picture of the church in the candlestick. You say, how could you see a picture of the church in the candlestick? Well, the candlestick was a light bearer. It produced light. And that's what the church does. As the priest left the table of showbread, he would approach the golden altar place incense on the altar, then it would turn around on the left side, the south side, going back out into the courtyard, and as he turned and passed the candlestick, 
He would have to go past the candlestick with his light. It would be on his right hand. It would be on his right hand. How is that significant? Well, the right hand is a hand of preeminence and of power. You remember when Jacob had a son, a youngest son, named Benjamin. His mother named him Benoni, meaning Benjamin. And that word means son of my right hand. The place of preeminence, the place of power, the place of preferment. Son of my right hand. The candlestick was on the right hand. Colossians 3.1 says, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The place of preeminence. Mark 14.62 The high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Hebrews 10, 12. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. The right hand of God. He took the place of preeminence because He deserves the place of preeminence. He is the Father's beloved Son. He is the one that the Father crowns with glory and honor. And the shaft of the lampstand stood above all the branches. Where the branches? The, the shaft is Jesus. And the shaft was above the branches. And He is above us. Being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the only Lord. John put it like this, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now where is the picture of the church? The lampstand that gave the light was in the tabernacle. Not outside the tabernacle. It was in the tabernacle. And the light of the gospel shines forth out of the Lord's churches. Churches that are true to God, that preach the gospel of saving grace, are lamps in a dark city and in a dark world. Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what is the candlestick? I read Revelation chapter 1 in closing. 
John was visited by the Lord Jesus one Sunday afternoon on the Isle of Patmos. And John recounts that meeting with Jesus. And he records it in Revelation chapter 1. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the patch with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine grass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, that's the pastors, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels. The word is angeloi, and it means pastors, messengers, of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. There's a connection between the candlestick of the Old Testament and the candlesticks of the New Testament. Trinity Baptist Church of Chiang Mai is a candlestick. It is a lampstand in Chiang Mai where the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached every Lord's Day. And men can hear how to be saved. How to know God. How to approach God. What is the order of approaching God? They can learn it at Trinity Baptist Church. Thank God for the church. I thank the Lord every day for the many years He's allowed me to pastor His churches. The seven golden candlesticks, the seven literal New Testament churches that existed in that day. May the Lord continue to bless His Word from Trinity Baptist Church. Let's bow together in prayer. As we bow together in prayer, Brother Downs, could you dismiss us please this morning? Our Father, we thank you.